Listen in on this week's Scientific American 60 Second Science Podcasts. I'm podcast editor Steve Mursky. Besides helping to create the United States of America, Benjamin Franklin, of course, invented the lightning rod, which sits atop buildings and protects them by attracting lightning strikes and conducting them to the ground, rather than through the structure, which can cause fires or outright electrocutions. But what's better, a lightning rod with a round end or one that comes to a sharp point? According to the book Revolutionary Science by Steve Jones at University College London, Franklin liked lightning rods to be, in Franklin's own words, made sharp as a needle. And so in North America, Jones writes, the use of one or the other was interpreted as a statement in favor of the rebels or of the crown. In fact, Jones continues, George III, to advertise his displeasure at the colonial revolt, had the sharpened structures on Buckingham Palace replaced with rounded versions. The king even pressured the Royal Society, the leading scientific organization of the time and still highly regarded today, to endorse the idea that round-ended lightning rods were better than Franklin's pointy ones, to which the president of the Royal Society responded, I will always do my best to fulfill the wishes of His Majesty, but I am able to change neither the laws of nature nor the effects of its forces. Some Americans today, especially a few in positions of authority, would do well to acknowledge the reality of the laws of nature and the effects of its forces. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. A dying battery is a huge annoyance for cell phone users, but for engineers, it's inspiration. Can we design a smartphone which can make a phone call and you can have a conversation without the need for any kind of a battery? Sham Golakota is a computer scientist at the University of Washington, and he and his team have indeed designed a battery-free phone. It looks like a circuit board with touch-responsive numeric buttons, and it runs on just a few microwatts of power which it harvests from light and from the radio signals emanating from a nearby wireless base station. The team achieved the battery-free, energy-efficient design by ditching two of the power-hungry features of modern cell phones. One, the test unit skips digital-to-analog conversion. And two, it does not generate its own wireless signals to make calls. Instead, in receiving mode, it absorbs incoming radio waves from the base station and converts them directly into vibrations of its speaker. In sending mode, it uses the vibrations of its onboard microphone to change the way radio waves are reflected back to the base station. And it worked to make a Skype call. Hello? Hello from a battery-free cell phone. The findings appear in the Proceedings of the Association for Computing Machinery on Interactive, Mobile, Wearable, and Ubiquitous Technologies. The demo device does have limitations. It can only stray 50 feet from the base station, and the voice quality is pretty lo-fi. And you can't check Facebook either, yet. Oh, <laughs> so we, we're going to get that. I mean, uh, this is, again, a first step. Think of it as like uh, you need to make a first move to basically get some place where we can actually harvest uh, power to do other operations. And it's those other operations that will ultimately be crucial. Because battery or not, you could argue that voice calls are by now just a neat retro feature of our ever smarter phones. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Your skin, just like many other parts of your body, is crawling with microscopic critters. It's a microbial zoo in a sense. (laughs) Heidi Kong, dermatology researcher at the National Institutes of Health. And that microbial zoo, the types of microbes in it, changes over time. Kong and her team observed some of those changes during a flare-up of eczema, a condition characterized by itchy, inflamed skin. On healthy skin and on patients with mild eczema, the researchers found a diverse roster of bacterial residents, including a species of staph bacteria called Staphylococcus epidermidis. But in patients suffering a severe bout of eczema, that diversity was disrupted, and strains of a different staph species dominated, Staphylococcus aureus. The research team then collected those Staph aureus strains from the eczema sufferers and swabbed them on the skin of mice. And that once healthy mouse skin grew thicker, as it does in eczema, and was invaded by immune response cells. While not proof, the results suggest that certain strains of Staph bacteria could be culpable in worsening eczema flares. The study's in the journal Science Translational Medicine. 
The genetic technique Kong and her team used, it's called shotgun metagenomics, gives a detailed snapshot of the microbiome, so it might be used to investigate other skin conditions too. For example, acne has been linked with propionobacterium acne. Um, There's interest in looking at other inflammatory skin diseases, such as rosacea or um, even psoriasis. And so there is the potential to use shotgun metagenomics to study inflammatory skin diseases and even skin cancers to better understand what are the microbes that might be there and what they may be doing. And whether certain members of that microbial menagerie might be mistreating the zookeeper. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. (laughs) 